Good morning. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I woke up this morning. And I came into this place to praise him and to worship him. Amen. Is there anyone else that joins me to this morning and says, yes, I've come to praise him. I've come to worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is a great God. He is great and perfect in all his ways. Amen. And he deserves our worship. And he deserves our praise. My God has made a way for me where there seemed to be no way. Where the world told me there's no way, God made a path. God made a path. Because with my God, everything is possible. With my God, all of my good is possible. Are you hearing me? With my God. All good things and all blessings are not held back from me. They are all possible. Amen? Let's raise our voices and our hands this morning and let's praise our God, the God of the impossible. Every chain. 
Now all of my fears I will turn into praise Shake off this as I sing out your name A victory case I will dance out in faith I will crush disappointment And break every chain Now all of my fear I will turn into praise Shake off this as I sing out your name A victory case I will dance out in faith I will crush disappointment and break every chain, 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 break every chain. Show me one thing you can do. Show me a mountain you can do. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me what earth he can find. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Nobody show. Show me one thing he can do. Show me a mountain. Show me what earth you can find. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Now all of my fear I will turn into praise. Take off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I, I will, will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Now all of my fear I will turn into praise. Take off this barrier as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Break every chain.
And I believe, I believe all things are possible. All things are possible to him who believes. And I walk in belief. Anyone else? I walk in belief. I walk in belief. I don't care what report this world has. I don't care what they try to put in my ear, little words. I walk in belief. Because my God is the God of the impossible. There is no word that can be spoken to me by this world that is stronger than one word from him. Jesus. There is nothing stronger. They can speak the word cancer, but you know, I got, I got a word stronger. Blood. Amen? They can speak the word defeat, but I can speak one word. Blood. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through We've heard the tide will never change they haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. So much power in your name. Move the immovable. Break the unbreakable. God, we believe. God, we believe.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Scripture talks about how there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. There's nothing that can separate us from this love. This love is so special that before we were in our mother's womb, it predestined the good life for us. In Jeremiah, he says, I know the thoughts and the plans that I have towards you. That's that love that prepared those plans. That's the love of God that gives us these thoughts. It's the love of God that allows us to be enveloped in the body of Christ. His love has provided everything, amen? We're going to sing about that love this morning. I think it's reckless. I think it's reckless to love someone when they've done you wrong. To love someone and die for someone with no rhyme or reason when they did nothing for you to benefit you. When they were contrary to what you believe, he still died for us when we were serving Satan. I don't know about you guys, but my past is not perfect. And he loved me in spite of my past. That's reckless. That's reckless. It's reckless for God to send his only begotten son. So reckless for me. spoke a word you were singing over me and you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me oh God and you have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, right still I'm found, leaves the nine and nine. And I couldn't earn it. No, I don't deserve it, but still you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. your foe, steal your love off of you, you have been so, so good to me, when I felt no worth, you paid it all. You have been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And all the chases me down, fight still life, fight peace tonight. And I could it, no, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away
poisonous song. There's nothing that his love won't do for you. Help me sing it, help me sing it. There's no doubt you won't keep that. Now you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Now you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. There's no wall you won't kick down. Why you won't tear down coming after me. So
the Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Is it the
what's happening. Let me tell you what's happening. Let me tell you what's happening. Right now, in this moment, in this place, the master sculptor took his chisel and his hammer, and during worship, he's chiseling you, hammering you into the form that he created you to live in all your life. And you've been walking around, some people, bound up, and you're functional in your dysfunction. And what God is saying is during worship, I'm taking out that chisel and I'm making you after my image the way I created you from the very beginning. And if you will enter in and enter in and enter in, he'll keep chipping it away and you'll walk full, you'll walk free as the man, as the woman of God, he created you to be. And you will not be held back. There will not be limitations. No more limitations because you're walking fully in who he made you to be. So when we worship and we say, I want more, I want more, I want more, more. That's what's happening. Come on, enter in, enter in, enter in. as usual guys. this is an experience with God an experience with his presence we're gathered here for him we'll let him move how he desires to move Yes. 
out and touch him. He's right here. He's that close. And he walks by and he walks through and he walks by and he walks through and he touches this one. Said, this is mine. This is mine. And he walks by and he walks through and he touches this one. Said, This is mine. This is mine. Thank you for your presence. Praise God for your presence. For this manifestation that you've given us this morning of your presence. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. No, no one wants to leave this place. And we don't have to. Just stay right here in, this, in the presence of the Lord. He is here walking amongst us. He's right here walking through, touching each one. Touching you just where you need it. God, if you would lift your hands to the Lord. All over the room, lift your hands to the Lord. Just as a sign of acceptance of that which he has done, that which he is doing. It's just a sign of acceptance saying, I acknowledge you, I accept 
that which you have done, that which you have said. Whether you have your hands stretched all the way up towards heaven or just out in front of you or by your side, wherever your hands are, you're lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. And these holy hands are a symbol of, of accepting, of receiving, of acknowledging, of releasing our faith in that which he has done, that which he is doing, that which he will do in this day of divine appointments. This is a day of divine appointments, divine appointments, divine appointments. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And what I saw earlier, just a few moments ago, the, the master sculptor wielding his hammer and his chisel, you know how after a natural sort, a sculptor, a master sculptor is, he's taking a block and he's revealing what's inside of the block. He's unlocking, he's unleashing, he's releasing what's trapped within that slab of marble or concrete or whatever he's chiseling into. And he's unleashing it, but then once he unleashes it, it stands inert, stands without movement. It stands in one pose, one position. But this is what the Lord said, I'm chiseling, not so that you can stand still, but so that you can be turned loose and freed up so you can move like you've never moved before. So you can walk, you can dance, you can run, yes. But when I say he's turning you loose to move like you've never moved before, the very same things that you were created for from the foundations of the world, the Lord is saying, I'm releasing you to it. No more limitations. No more limitations of the, the thoughts or the opinions or the values of other people or even your own self-conditioned perspective. No more of that hindering you or holding you back. But that which I'm chiseling away is going to take away these limitations. And every time we're in worship, we're lifting up our hands to the mighty God. He's saying, I'm chiseling you. I'm preparing you. I'm crafting you for that which you already are. And I'm releasing that which is dormant within you, that which is laid inert within you. I'm turning you loose to it, releasing you to move forward. And that's what happened this morning. And trust me, rest assured, every time we enter into a place of worship, and wh whether it's in this building or you're in your car, or you're in your house, wherever you are, you can have that same experience because when we leave this atmosphere, we don't lose this atmosphere. Never, never do we lose it. So how many of you are carriers, carriers of what we have experienced, what we are going through this morning as he's walking through the aisles and walking through these spaces? My Lord, we acknowledge the receipt of all, of all, of all you've crafted us to be in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody who receives it, just say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Say amen one more time. Amen. See, when you draw near to him, he draws near to you. But that's not a one-time experience or destination. Every time you draw near to him, he draws near to you. You draw near to him, he draws near to you. You draw near to him, he draws near to you. That's ongoing, never stopping, ceaseless. Every day, all the time, you draw near to him, he draws near to you. That's what he's doing. It's what he's doing in this house. It's what he's doing in your heart right now. Yeah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to ask Micah, come on up here. Uh, he's going to share the, uh, the announcements. I want to welcome everyone who is here in the room, everyone who's watching online. We're so grateful for your presence watching there. Your faith being released online is a huge part, a significant part of what happens in this room. So thank you for not just sitting there and listening and watching, but actively engaging your faith every time you watch. We're so grateful for you. And for everybody in the room and all those who are here, uh, maybe it's been a while, or if you've been here, this is your first time, we wanna welcome you. So grateful for your presence here this morning. Mike is gonna share some announcements, but listen carefully, we call them the anointed announcements. <laughs> yeah. This ain't just a time to say, okay, I can take a break now and just kind of chill out until we get to the word. No, no. Announcements are ministry. Are you listening to me? 
announcements ministry. So I want you to receive the ministry of the anointed announcements. Put your hands together and welcome Micah. Amen. Amen. Man, I'm sorry. I, I, I guess I'm not quite ready to transition yet, but we must go on. We must go on. I'm, I walked up here and I looked at the monitor and my back, I'm sweating. Like, good God Almighty, I don't know about you guys, but I have so much fun in worship and, and just being able to serve God in any capacity. It's a true honor, true blessing. And pastor said that these announcements are anointed. So shout out to God. Amen. Shout out to God. Amen. So on, on this first one, it's the vision. It says, awakening our community and people everywhere to the presence the purpose, and the power of God. And that's what we're all about. All about awakening our community, people everywhere to the presence, the purpose, and the power of God. Amen. Now, every Thursday at 6.15, we have an online Bible study. Online Bible study. And right now we're doing a book study, and it's on Christ the healer. Who believes that Christ is still a healer? Does anybody believe that he's changed and he doesn't heal anymore? Well, we don't believe it. We believe that he's still the healer, that it's his purpose to heal, and it is his will to heal. Amen? So we believe that that's something that's already been done and that it's our job to release our faith to manifest that healing. Amen? So here we go. Let's look at this. In Mark, the 14th chapter, it says, And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. A lot of times when we read the Bible, we've been reading it since we were young. Or our parents read it to us when we were young. Maybe it's like a bedtime story. So a lot of times that translates into us viewing the scriptures in a fairy tale like way. Or we give the, the characters in the Bible, we give them traits that uh, Disney characters have, and there's no personification of it. So we got to understand when we're reading this, that this is an actual account, and these people thought like we thought. So if I saw someone get their ear cut off, I'm going nuts, right? So a lot of times, oh, he cut his ear off, and they were just watching. No, 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 no. Like, it was going down. Like, violent, blood, it was nasty. I, I, it was nasty. You can turn it on certain channels and you can see people have surgeries and whatnot and they slice and stuff. And I, Yeah, it was bad. So they cut this man's ear off. Right? And if we keep reading, we read that Jesus spoke and Jesus said, suffer thee thus far. In another account, it says that he who lived by the sword died by the sword. Right? And he, so he said, look, we're not going down like that. It's not going down like that. And then the Bible says that Jesus touched his ear and healed him. I'm going to read that again because y'all ain't seeing it like I'm seeing it. So he got his ear cut off and it's bad, 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 bad. Then Jesus touched his ear and healed him. He touched his ear and healed him. He touched him with, like, with his hands and he healed him. That's, a man, that's absolutely mind-expanding. Ain't that right, Pastor? That's absolutely amazing. And this book that we're reading, it just gives us an in-depth study of how we're supposed to do. Because the Bible says that greater works will we do because he's gone to the Father. Not greater as in we're going to do something better than walking in water. But no, 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 no. But greater in number because there's so much more of us. Whereas Jesus could be in one place at one time, we can be everywhere. Amen? So greater are going to be the works that we do. Amen? The next slide is on intercessory prayer. Those that are determined to change the world decided to pray. I'm going to read that again. Those that determined to change the world decided to pray. Who's a world changer? Do we have anybody who's going to change the world, change their community, change their home, change their family lineage? Those who are determined to change, they decided to pray. So every Saturday, every Saturday at 3, we have prayer, intercessory prayer here. And I'm telling you guys, it's awesome. I was here yesterday, me and Jesus, me and the Holy Ghost, 
we had us a good time. And we would love to see you guys there because those who determined to change the world decided to pray. Amen. Now, on Saturday, April 2nd, at 9 o'clock, Living Word is having a men's breakfast. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, we're at Awakened Church. Why are we talking about Living Word? Because we're all the body of Christ. There is no division. There, there's all unity. When Christ Jesus sees the world, he sees his church. He doesn't see, oh, that's awakened, that's living the word. No, he sees his people. He sees his son. Amen? Can we agree on that? So we want to connect with them and support them. And on Saturday, April 2nd, they're having a men's breakfast. And then on Sunday, April 3rd, they're having a special speaker named John George. And that's going to be April 3rd at 10 a.m., and also at 6. So we want to encourage you guys to go out. Us men, that is. I said you guys. but it, we, There's an encouragement for us men to go out and support them. Amen? And then on March 26th at 12 a.m. Somebody say late in the midnight hour. <laughs> in the midnight hour, we're going to have midnight worship led by Miss Allison. Hey, Miss Allison, could you stand up, please? Could you stand up? This is Miss Allison. And on March the 26th, that's coming up. March the 26th coming up. Is that next week? Is that this Saturday? This Saturday, late in the midnight. Who? I'm, I'm about to stay up. No, 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 no. So, the Bible tells us about um, the third hour, the, excuse me, the third watch of the night, or the third hour and a half, late in the night, that is the most demonic time. Amen? That's the most demonic time. I, now, when I was growing up, I'm going to say something. I don't get offended, but they used to say there wasn't nothing open at night but liquor stores and other stuff, right? So I say that to say that believers need to be doing work at night as well. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I encourage rest, but this is an event, and at this event, it's going to be at midnight, and there's going to be some spiritual warfare going on, right? I'm excited, so we encourage you guys to come. I'm going to be, look, I'm putting my words on it. I'm going to have to put them kids to sleep and go get my praise on, all right? And they'll, they'll, they'll be thankful that I did. They'll be glad that I did. Amen. There's a night of intercession that we're going to have here at Awaken, March 29th. That's going to be a Tuesday from 645 to 8 o'clock. And it's open to the public. Night of intercession. A night of intercession. So this is going to be a night that's dedicated to the prayers. We've heard pastors say that he's calling out the A-O-J. Excuse me, the I-O-J. <laughs> The IOJ, I say AOJ, I guess Awaken of John, but we're doing the IOJ. It's not just exclusive to Awaken, it's the IOJ, the intercessors of Jonesboro. We're calling all of them to come and pray with us because we, we're called by his name and we're going to humble ourselves and pray and he's going to hear us from heaven and he's going to heal our land, amen. I believe the word doesn't change. I believe that's still relevant for us today, that prayer is us getting heavenly assistance. And I need his assistance, amen? I need some help. I can't do it by myself. So we're going to intercede for the nations. We're going to intercede for our jobs, our workplaces, our family. We're going to intercede for the body of Christ, and we're going to ask heaven to come and help us, intervene on our behalf. On Saturday, April 2nd, we're going to have some Easter crafts. This sounds fun. Look at the slide. Ain't that beautiful? All the flowers. I believe heaven has flowers. I, I mean, I ain't been there yet. Well, it was a long time ago. I don't remember. But I believe there's going to be beautiful flowers in a, just a beautiful time, kind of like this. So Easter crafts are going to be on Saturday, on April 2nd, from 1 to 3 o'clock. We are still reading the Bible in one year. Right now, we're in Joshua. One and three, and we're also in Luke 157 through 80. 
57 through 80. So we're still reading the Bible. The Word of God is alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing, it divides to the very asunder of the spirit and the soul. All, it, all are naked in the eyes of the Word. Amen. So this Word is still relevant today. God still speaks through His Word. Not much has changed. Amen. And the Word that is made flesh is what we're enveloped in. We're seated in Christ Jesus. So if we're seated in him and we in him we live, move, and have our beating, I think that we should have communion and fellowship with that word. We're one. How, me and my wife are one. So if we're one, then how can we not have fellowship together? How can we not get each other's mind on certain situations? The same thing is with God. We're one with Christ Jesus. So we should get his mind on things, and his mind is in his word. So as a church, we're reading the Bible through the year. Amen? Well, praise God. And this next slide is talking about the increments campaign. Heart for the house. How much personal debt and awakened church mortgage debt can we produce and eliminate in 2020? There's a prayer to release, reduce, and remove all debt. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. Because it just didn't say the church. It also said your house. So I don't know about you guys, but I might got a little bit. All right. So if this is a prayer to release, remove, and to reduce that debt, then I think it's something to get excited about. Can, can we just take maybe three seconds and get excited? Well, well, okay, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, see, right now there's something called March Madness going on, and people play basketball, and their team wins and loses, and when they, they lose, you see tears. And when they win, you see shouting and jumping up and down. So, okay, give me one. I know you guys might not feel like it, but it's not about what you feel like. <laughs> I don't know who told you that. So it's about faith. And in faith, you do things even though you don't feel like it. So, because we're in faith, this is a faith church, and we're talking about reducing we're talking about eliminating all debt, not only in this church, but also in my house and in your house. We're going to take three seconds, okay? One, two, three. Woo! All right. All right. March Madness. All right. Okay, okay. Next slide. Heart for the, so, so this slide goes with the first slide that we just talked about. And you guys... Look what the Lord has done. He started us off at 0 .79. Actually, this wasn't even the start because it's showing February, March, but we started in January, right? But it has been reduced. The debt on the mortgage has been reduced 1.07%. Yo, because pastor says, yo, if he can do the one percent, then the 99, the 99 is on its way, guys. My God, see, we just got through singing this song, and I'm finna sit down, I'm sorry, I know, I know, I'm finna sing, we're finna sit down, but we just got through singing this song, and it says that God leaves the one for the 99. No, 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 excuse me. He said he leaves the 99 for the one. So that means that every piece is important for him. If he leaves the 99 for just one, I don't know if I would leave 99 for one. I'd be like, man, you know what? That one got away, but we still got 99. But no, 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 no. God's not like that. God will leave the 90, he will leave the 99 to save the one. Because that one is so important to him. So how important do you think that 99% is? Ah, it's so important to him. And we're believing God in advance that it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. Okay, those are your anointed announcements. We're going to transition into offering. Brother Randy, come on up. If y'all thought the announcements was anointed, watch it. Watch out now. This gift is going to be special. Hey. Oh, my goodness. How do you follow all this stuff? Well, we got some great people in this church, don't we? Great leaders. And I tell you, um, 
I love to talk about the offering because it's always an opportunity for us. It's actually an opportunity for us to receive back. And so when Pastor asked me to, to say something, I thought, oh, gosh, man, there's so much to pick from. This could be so much fun. And now we've had so much fun. I'm going to do this real quick, okay? But uh, if you want to follow along, you can start maybe at Matthew 13 through 17. Um, you know, you can preach Malachi 3.10, and you can say the windows of heaven are going to be opened up when we bring our tithes into the storehouse. And you can preach in Luke where Jesus said, give, and it will be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, and running over. And we see multiplication just like Michael was showing up here. We're already multiplying. God's done 1.7%. He's going to do the whole thing. And there's so many verses in the Bible that you can talk about seed growth. When you plant a seed in the parables, you know, Jesus said 30, 60, 100 fold. When you plant it on good ground, I feel very confident this is good ground. You can feel confident when you do give of your work, which is our toil, blood, sweat, tears. It's something you did out there. And if you're not able to give like that, you can volunteer. You can give of yourself, give of your service, give of your heart. So there was all these things that can be talked about, but I wanted to, or I guess the Lord just laid on my heart to say just a couple of things of the heart of the whole thing, the heart of the whole thing. And when you look at, at Matthew uh, three, and I probably won't read all of this. It was when uh, John the Baptist was baptizing. People were coming down uh, to the Jordan every day, and he was baptizing people. And usually there was a, a crowd out on the side watching what was going on. And Jesus came down. John knew it was him the moment he started walking down there. And Jesus asked John to baptize him. And and John was like, "Whoa, dude." <laughs> I know who you are. You're the reason I've been saying all this stuff. You know, I can't baptize you. You should baptize me. And Jesus said, no, let's, for the righteousness sake, for the word's sake, let's fulfill what's supposed to be fulfilled. You baptize me. But when Jesus came up out of the water, the windows of heaven opened up, and the Lord God, Father God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It was an audible voice. The people who were standing on the shore heard it. Everybody heard it. They saw the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. A confirmation. He was sent from God. He was God's Son. Then if you turn uh, maybe quickly to Matthew 17. And this is talking about the transfiguration. You remember when uh, they went up on the mountain, Peter, James, and John went with Jesus up on the mountain, and, um, you know, all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus is transfigured. His, his face is so bright, you can't hardly look upon him. His robe is just radiant, so radiant. And, you know, Peter, James, and John are just kind of freaking out. They're like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? And um, so Peter says, Lord, and, and Moses, and Elijah, or Elisha, is there, and uh, so Peter doesn't really know what to do, he's a good follower, and he's saying, okay, Lord, we're going to take care of you, what do you want us to do, maybe we'll build a tent for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elisha, and uh, Elias, and, um, and all of a sudden, there's another voice from heaven, just like when the Lord spoke, when Jesus came up out of the water, and he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. You don't need to make a tent not to belittle anything Moses did because he was one of the greatest prophets ever and not to belittle Elisha. But it's this time, it's this covenant, it's this person, it's my son, my beloved, hear him. Now turn real quickly maybe to John 19, and let's see something here. 
In John 19, this is where, um, as Micah said, the ear's already been cut off. Jesus already touched him and healed him, and they whisked him away. And he went, you know, with the mob. They tied him up, just treated him like a common criminal. He had said, you know, I was with you every day in the synagogue talking. Why didn't you get me then? Well, they knew why they didn't get him then. They couldn't have an excuse. Now they had an excuse. So he's in front of Pilate. And Pilate, you know, they've been going back and forth from Herod to Pilate, Pilate to Herod. And um, Pilate's wife has already said to him, I had a dream about this dude. Um, be really careful with what you do with him. And so Pilate's talking to Jesus, and Jesus has been silent. And he, then it says, Thus saith Pilate, on, um, this is John 19.10, Thus saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest that I have power to crucify thee, and have the power to release thee? And Jesus answered, and he said, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it be given from thee from above. Therefore, he that delivereth me unto thee has the greater sin. From that moment on, it says from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. His wife had already told him, I dreamed about this dude. And the way Jesus answered him, he knew there was a higher calling on Jesus than just to get out of there. He knew it. I think he knew that Jesus if there was a son of God, Pilate said, this is the guy. Now, when we give, we have this opportunity that we're talking about to give. But the heart of it is because Jesus gave to us. He gave us everything while we were still sinners. Everything while we were still sinners. Everything. You know, the Bible says we love because he loved us first. We give our offerings in honor because he loved us and because he gave us everything. And he did it first. Proverbs, I think it's 3, 9, says, Honor the Lord with your first fruits. Jesus was God's first fruit. So today, we give knowing that we're going to receive. We give knowing we're debt free. We give knowing we get 30, 60, and 100 fold. We give knowing all of these things. But above all, we give because he loved us and he gave his life for us. That is our opportunity. And that's why 2 Corinthians 9 says, be a cheerful giver. We have a whole lot to be grateful for. So take your offerings, hold them up to the Lord. Lord, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Savior, our everything. He gave everything. And it's because of your love, Father God, that he gave everything that started the whole thing. So we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. We love you, we praise you, and we give these tithes and offerings to our love for you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, thank you. Ah, glory to God. <laughs> praise God. Well, there are three different ways to give, of course, in the buckets, in the aisle. Also online at awaken.tv and then also the text to give at 870-309 or 399, excuse me, 1811. So let me ask you one simple question. Do you believe God responds to you when you give to him? Yes. Amen. Well, he just responded then. Amen. So I want you to lift a hand to heaven and say, thank you, Lord that you always respond to me. When I sow, 
when I give into the kingdom of God. And I receive the reward, the harvest off of my sowing right now in the name of Jesus. And I release blessing to you. The blessing of increase be upon you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, uh, I know we, we received quite a bit this morning, haven't we? Yes. Amen. So uh, if you have your Bible, though, uh, we are going to do start into part two of Living by the Word and the Spirit. Uh, part two is titled Words by Which to Live. Words by Which to Live. Miss Dorothy, if I can have your hand for a moment here. Father, what I heard is that this too shall pass. Amen. That thing which has sought to hinder or limit or restrict or hold you back, yes. no more. Amen. No more. Jesus. No more. Amen. No more. You. Now you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, mights, and dominion. And so it's not the things of the flesh or the things that are natural that you're hindered by or that seek to impede your progress. It's the enemy's camp. So now what we do is we release confusion into the enemy's camp. Confusion into the enemy's camp. We confuse all of the plans and strategies, the wiles of the enemy that would seek to come against Miss Dorothy and her family. And in the name of Jesus, we restrict all of the movements of the enemy. In Jesus' name, I release that anointing on you. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Smith Wigglesworth had this statement here uh, that he released into the earth in 1947. So back, way back in the 1900s. Smith Wigglesworth, I, if you don't know who he is, uh, an apostolic man, a prophetic man, a man of faith, uh, an evangelist, uh, he, he, and he also taught. I think the only thing he didn't officially do much of was pastoring, but he walked in all of these various giftings and offices. Before he left the earth, he released this prophetic word. He said, when the new church phase is on the wane, there will be evidenced in the church of something that has not been seen before, a coming together of those with an emphasis on the word and those with an emphasis on the spirit. When the Word and the Spirit come together, there will be the biggest movement of the Holy Spirit that the nation and indeed the world has ever seen. It will mark the beginning of a revival that will eclipse anything that has been witnessed. Now, how many of you, through the, through the course of your lifetime, whether it's, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, or more, how many of you have witnessed some pretty unique or uh, significant things in either church or in the world of the church, the kingdom of God, ministers or ministries. Well, Smith Wigglesworth prophesied way back then that those kinds of things would happen, but there would be a time where the, as he put it here, the new church phase would be on the wane. The new church phase, in a sense, can be categorized as the charismatic and word of faith movement that we saw and experienced some of us and some to more degrees in the late mid to late 1960s which would have been roughly 20 years after he prophesied this into the 70s into the 80s and into the 90s in the 90s towards the end of the 90s brother Hagen started going around the country uh, Kenneth Hagen senior started going around the country holding what he called Holy Ghost meetings I had the privilege of being in some of those Holy Ghost meetings and it was, he said that the Lord impressed upon him if he didn't teach this generation, meaning the generation at that time in the late 90s, if he didn't teach this generation the move of the Spirit, it would be lost. And so he went around the country teaching that. And then there were many of those who were in those meetings who took on that mantle, Mark Hankins being one of those. How many of you know who Mark Hankins is? So Brother Mark uh, took that upon himself as well, received of that mantle of that anointing, went around the country, started holding Holy Ghost meetings as well, and others did as well. What I'm seeing and hearing is that we are in this season that uh, he prophesied, that Smith Wigglesworth prophesied, that we would be in this time where the emphasis on the Word and the emphasis on the Spirit would merge together in a perfect harmony and unity. And so that's what we're seeing, and that's what we're on the fringe of experiencing. Things have begun but as he said, as 
Smith Wigglesworth said. Now, if a man can raise, I don't know, was it like close to 19, 20 people from the dead? Literally. We're not talking about, you know, they, you know, stop breathing for a few moments. I'm talking about dead people, dead people, people dead. One in particular, I heard the story and read in this book. I think it's in The Secret of His Power, that book. This one individual had died, had been died for, had been dead for a while. I'm not sure how long, but it was longer than a few minutes, a few hours. Might have been overnight, a day or two or three. They're holding his home going, I think. He grabs the body, sticks it up against the wall, and says, Live! <laughs> Corpse slid down. <laughs> Couldn't have been that long because rigor mortis hadn't fully set in, but it was long enough that, you know, this verified dead picks him up. Live! Slides back down. I think he did it at least three, maybe four times. But then on that, that last time, he said, I command you to live. The corpse, former corpse, started breathing. So I assume that anybody who's like that might be able to discern what God is saying for the end times. Amen. And so he said, it's going to eclipse anything that you've ever witnessed before anything you've ever witnessed before. Amen. Amen. So I believe we're a part of that end time gathering of believers and warriors who are supposed to walk in this, experience this. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So if you come across a dead person, you know, now don't just go to a, a memorial and say, I'm going to raise something up here. <laughs> you better hear, hear from God. You got scripture on it, but hear from God. Because, you know, Brother Wigglesworth would walk into a memorial service and people would walk over and say, you're not going to raise them from the dead, are you? They've been dead like a week. So he said, well, if the Lord says so, he would hear from God. We have to hear from God. John 6, 63, Jesus was speaking. Now, so when we hear this scripture, we're hearing from God. Jesus himself said, because he's the word made flesh. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So every one of the words of Jesus, they contain the substance of the realm of the spirit, the, the life of the spirit of God. They contain the life of God, the Zoe life, the God kind of life. And so when we hear his words, we can receive of the spiritual substance and of the life in those words. Proverbs 4, I'm going to do a little review here real quick from last week. Proverbs 4, 4 and 20 through 22. He taught me also, said unto me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. My son, my daughter, attend to my words, incline your ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For, here's the reason why. There's a purpose behind keeping these words in your heart. Now, I went into a lot more detail last week. I'm just going to kind of summarize through this right now. For they, these words, the words that you find, that you attend to, you incline your ears to, these words are health, are life, and to those that find them, and health to all their flesh. There's no limitation to what part of your flesh these words are life to. There was a time I had this growth that came up over my eye. I was in Bible school, and I was in healing school. I was actually starting, just starting to serve in healing school at Ramah. Had this growth come up over one of my eyes. It was a painful thing, and it split open, and it started to bleed, you know, a little bit. And I'd be in class, and I, you know, I could barely see. But more than that, I could barely focus because it hurt so much. It was a sharp cutting kind of thing. And I thought, ain't this something? Here I go starting healing school, and here, here this thing jumps up on my eye. Well, fortunately, I'd been taught well, and so what I did is I put the word on it, literally. <laughs> I started reading scripture. Brother Hagin would say, you know, when, when something comes up against you, double up on your word reading. Don't, don't minimize or reduce. Double up on your reading of the word of God. And so what I did is I literally made that eye read the, the healing scriptures. I put that eye right there. Yeah. And I did that for I don't know how long, day after day after day. So one day I was getting ready to go to school. And so, I mean, it was noticeable. It was, it was puffy, kind of noticeable. And one day I was getting ready, shaving in, in the mirror, just kind of. And then I looked in the mirror and I said, hey, what happened to that thing? And then I literally couldn't remember which eye it was over. Literally. I mean, it was over one of these two eyes. I got two, eyes, two of them. It was over one of them. 
I couldn't remember what, and you couldn't tell that there was ever a growth there or a scar there. Well, see, what I had done is I put the word on it, but then God gave me a word that had spirit life in it. And the word that he said is, call it a dead issue. People would ask me, Brother Lance, what's that over your eye? And I would look at it without batting the eye and say, a dead issue. And be like, huh? It's a dead issue. It's a substance. It's a growth. It doesn't belong there. It's dead. And I kept saying that. I kept putting the word on it. And over time, this word became health and life to all my flesh, including my eyes. See, that's what happens when we attend to his word, these kinds of things. This inherent life exists in us as a permanent word of life when we get a hold of these words. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus is quoting uh, Deuteronomy in Deuteronomy 8, 3. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So now what natural food is to the physical body, the word of God is to the spirit of a man or woman. The word of God is literally spirit food. It is spirit nourishment. So every time you read the word, your spirit is being nourished and strengthened. Now, how many of y'all will go without eating regular food uh, if you're not on a fast? But you'll go without eating regular food days at a time. Any, anybody? 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 How come? Why y'all be eating all that food? Two, three times a day. Why, why y'all eating all that food? Because you want your body to be nourished and have fuel, have strength. But a lot of people, they run around in life, the very thing that is supposed to be that which sustains them, they refuse to eat the word of God more than once or twice a week. See, that is one of the reasons we're doing the daily Bible reading. It's because our spirits need to be fed the word of God. It needs to be fed regularly, all the time, consistently, continually fed the word of God. And so that's why we, you know, I'm, I'm into the scriptures, man. They call me, man, you use so many scriptures. You know, we just got so much scripture. Oh, so what, you have so much life? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have so much life from so much scripture. Yeah. And that's why we do this is because there's life in the word. There's life in the word. There is life in the word. So let me ask you a question. How do you live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? How do you live by it? Uh, Job 11, verse 12, notice what it says here. Job 11, verse 12. Doth not the ear try words, and the mouth taste his meat? So you take and put food in your physical mouth, and it tastes, it discerns, it starts to chew upon the food that is put in your mouth. Well, the same thing happens when you hear words. It, your ear starts to chew, to discern, to pay attention to, to start to assimilate assimilate you ever heard that word assimilate assimilation I'm not talking about the you know the Star Trek version of it for all, all you Trekkies out there you know the Borg you shall be assimilated resistance is futile you know, not that I watch it all the time so, I may have seen a commercial or something <laughs> no I, I've watched it before and I've heard that statement and they'll say you will be assimilated we are the Borg you will be assimilated resistance is futile now, it'd be great if people would just say, you know what? I will be assimilated by the word of God. Resistance is futile. <laughs> he is the Lord. <laughs> and that's what you might need to remember here when you're reading the word. He's saying, I am the Lord. <laughs> you will be assimilated. <laughs> Resistance is futile. Because <laughs> that's, you know, that was a, that'll happen when you read the word, when you get that word and you, it will become assimilated. The word assimilation means the process of taking in and fully understanding information or ideas, it also means the absorption uh, and digestion of food or nutrients by the body or any biological system. So your body has this capacity to assimilate the food that you receive. Now, what happens if you have bad food? 
What's your assimilation like? <laughs> you will start to decline based on eating bad food over an extended period of time. I'm not talking about you went out and you had some cheesecake, a cheesecake factory once, because I like cheesecake. <laughs> but what I am saying is if that's the continual lifestyle, it's nonstop fried food. It's nonstop junk food with color red number, dye number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Stuff that's banned in un other countries and stuff that uh, has been linked together with cancer. And you're like, yeah, but it tastes good. Well, it's all right if it tastes good once, but if it's tasting good, you know, 350 days out of the year, then you might have some things to adjust on because you're assimilating what you eat. You heard the statement, you are what you eat. Well, that's true not only of the physical things we eat, but the things that we eat in our ears. Some people think that your ears is a dumpster. They come by and start talking to you about junk food gossip, junk food innuendos, junk food opinions and perspectives, and then we just start chomping on it, chomping on it, because we're listening to that junk. Stop listening to it. Tell people, you know. Now, I'll be courteous the first time when people start trying to dump stuff in my ears that don't belong in my ears. I'll be courteous, and I'll, I'll just redirect the conversation. But I have literally, you know, after a while, people like, you keep talking junk food in my ears. I have literally, while they're in mid-sentence, done this. I said, I ain't got time for all that stuff. My ears are not dumpsters. You're, no dumpster fires here. <laughs> so you got to pay attention to what you're hearing. And that's not only with other people, but things you watch on television. you got to watch what you watch and listen to and pay attention to it. Years ago, I was feeling anxious and anxiety, and my, my body started to act strange. And then I, this is what the Lord said. You need to stop watching all that CSI stuff. Because all you're doing is watching death and, and death. And, and then crazy death. And the Lord said, you need to chill out on all that stuff. Now listen, you know, you might watch something here and there and, and not, it's okay. Not that you have to watch it, but it's okay. But then there reaches a point of saturation and your, your soul starts to tilt and say, I can't handle this. I'm being assimilated. I have been assimilated by, well, you need to change what you're assimilating into. Okay, I'll keep moving on because, you know, I might be stepping on some toes here. But assimilation is where the word reaches into and settles into the heart. This is like digestion that provides nourishment to the body. Anybody ever seen a cow when it's chewing, the, it, you know, dips its head onto the gr ground and starts eating either hay or grass? Then it comes back up, and then what does it do? I mean, it's accentuated chewing, too. It's not just like engulfed. Like, you know, how we can do when we're hurry in the morning to get someplace. And it's like, let me chow down something real fast. Well, your body's not going to assimilate that too well because it's not digesting it properly. It's just going to kind of clump. And uh, I'll leave it there. I won't go any further. But it'll, it'll clump. <laughs> you don't want clumps. And so... Uh, a cow, though, has actually four compartments to their stomach. Did you know that? Did you know that? Four compartments. And the first time it chews the grass or whatever it is, it chews it, it goes down to that first compartment, and then you know what it does? Comes back up. <laughs> because the first time it's, it's dealing with the plant compounds, the stuff that's in the plant separating out the gases and different things, and then it brings it back up and then to choose it some more. See, a lot of times people get the word once and may or may not chew it and let it go down in clumps. <laughs> but it's not being assimilated. See, that's why he talked about meditating the word day and night, a consistent way of doing this regularly. Why? Because you obviously have the equivalency of four compartments within your spirit and soul that allows you to digest and assimilate the word. 
See, that's why some people, I've been listening to the word. Yeah, but are you meditating it? There is a difference to just being exposed to the word. You heard the word. It's bouncing up against your soul, but then it bounces back out. It regurgitates, but then we think we're done. Hey, I've meditated that thing one time. Well, you might need to meditate it more than once. You might even need to continue meditating on a certain thing, a certain scripture. I can't tell you how many times I've meditated. Himself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses with his stripes I am healed. Yeah, brother, there's a lot more healing scriptures. Yeah, there are, but that one keeps getting me healed. I mean, others have too, but that one, man, it's just doing the job. Why I want to reinvent the wheel when that one is working so effectively and so consistently. And so I'll just keep saying it over and over and over and over again. Brother, you're getting into rote memorization and rote confession and decreeing and declaring. No, not if it's the inspired, revelatory, prophetic word of God. Then you can meditate that same dude over and over and over and over and over again. Some people thought, Brother Hagin, that's all he knew was Mark 11, 22 and 23. The point is it worked, and the second point is a lot of people didn't get it, so he kept teaching it. Literally, he kept teaching it because he's, people say, well, when are you going to move on to something else? Well, he did move on to other things, but one of the things he said is, I'll move on to that when you get this. I mean, what's the point of going on to the fourth grade when you ain't finished kindergarten? <laughs> okay, I can see I'm really doing a great job this morning, right now, right here. Yeah, okay. So... Break it down, break it down, break it down. Assimple, assimilate the word into you. Because once a person assimilates the word of God, they can extract the nourishment of the spirit and take the words of life and live by the spirit of God. That's what we want to do, right? We want to live by the word and live by the spirit. Well, you've got to assimilate this, ingest it, take it in in such a way that you can extract all of the nourishment. And you know, the interesting thing is, there is no waste or filler in the, in the Word of God. Now, other things, physical food has fillers, and, you know, our bodies extract the nourishment, and then the, the waste is moved on. But the Word of God has no waste in it. Your spirit can assimilate, can receive the 100, 100% of the Word. Now, I'd love to think that when I preach, is my, word, my preaching is 100% Word. I would love to believe that, and I, I, I will confess it forever and ever. But, you know, there might be times where it's like 5% filler, 2% junk, instead of 100% word. But what you want to do is receive all of the word and let that become 100% nourishment to you through your meditation of what we say. So uh, I'm not going, this is not a test today. Maybe I'll test y'all next week. But uh, if you were here last week, what did I talk about? Could you give me two or three or four or five different things that we actually ministered, imparted, and shared from last week? And if you can't, my question becomes, what am I doing? And what are you doing? And why, why don't you re recall that? Is it because I'm very ineffective as a communicator and preacher and minister? If that's the case, pray for me. Pray for a brother. <laughs> Help me out. Pray for me. But if I'm communicating something and you can't remember what it is from week to week, then we got more issues to deal with as individuals and as a church. And it's mostly my fault. You, you hear what I'm saying? It's mostly my fault. I'm the one accountable standing before God and every one of, of the ministers who stand here and minister, we're accountable for impart, preparing and imparting, doing everything that we can. But if we're not getting the point across to where we're living by these words, then we need to figure out what's wrong. And I need to figure out what's wrong with me. I need to be a better preacher, a better pastor. If you're not remembering and taking hold of what was preached last week, and, you know, I preached a series on being redeemed last year. If, if that didn't impact your life like it impacted mine, then something's wrong with me that I, I didn't get that across to you well enough. And so we're going to get better at this. How many of you can, can, can believe with me for me to get better as a preacher, minister, pastor? Stretch your hands out towards me. Say, Lord, help him. Give him wisdom and revelation to do better as a preacher, teacher, and pastor. In Jesus' name, 
help the boy. All right. I receive it. I receive it. Glory to God. So Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. We're, we're, we've got a few more things to cover here this morning, then we'll, we'll let you go about your day. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Now notice he said there at the beginning, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? This word require means to ask as a favor. What is the Lord asking as a favor of you? It also means to seek. What is the Lord seeking of you? It means to be given upon request, to grant. It actually also means to beg. Now, this isn't begging from a, oh, help me, Lord, or, or help me, uh, Moses, help me. I'm begging you, please, 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 baby, please, please. That's not the kind of begging that he's doing. His begging is beseeching you. It's a strong, urgent request and entreaty to say, can you do this? Will you do this? And then he says, this is what I want you to do. Fear the Lord your God. I, I'm not going to talk about any of the rest of those in that passage other than the fear of the Lord our God. This isn't to be paralyzed with terror, be afraid of the Lord. No, this is to have an awesome type of reverence and respect for him. When he says something, it's like, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I hear you. I receive that. So when he said, listen, I'm a master sculptor, I'm chipping away, is that just the, the words of a man or is that the prophetic release and revelation that comes from the Lord? And if that's the case, every time you're in worship, whether it's in the room or elsewhere, what you're doing is you're having that chipped away, those things that have limited and restrained so you can become more dynamic and more fluid in the way that you live your life by the word and by the spirit. We have to have that reverence of the Lord. And he says, listen, I'm requiring this of you. I'm asking as a favor, but then it progresses to a strong entreaty. In other words, when we respond to the Lord on the initial phase of him saying, I'm requiring this of you, it's basically I'm asking you, I'm entreating you. Do you know people that if you ask them to, for a favor, they will basically say, yeah, if I can do it, yes. If I'm available, yes, I'll do it. No questions asked, no strings attached. But then if you have to keep going down the line to, with an individual and asking them a favor, and they're like, uh, I, you know, I really had a lot of stuff to do, but if I can get to it maybe in a month or two or a week or two, or well, now it could get stronger, the requirement, the request of that. And see, this is what the Lord does with us sometimes. He's like the ones who are, in horsing terms, rain-trained. You heard about rain-trained horses? You basically, because they've been trained so well, you can just lay the rain on, on their head, and they'll turn and twist and go and do and move. But then there's some horses, like the one that Ralph was telling us about when he was in Hawaii, that, you know, you tugging at the thing, and the horse just got a mind of his own going someplace else. I rode, I may have rode his, his cousin in New Mexico, that, that horse. We were in New Mexico, uh, went on this little horse riding. You know, it's supposed to be kind, gentle horses. And, you know, you're like, I'm like on the Bonanza horse. You know what I'm saying? But this one here, I must have got maniac, the horse. Because I was on this horse, and, like, he started galloping a little bit. Because they're supposed to just walk, you know. <laughs> you know, it's doing a little gallop thing. And then, and this might have been that horse that Balaam rode, one of his descendants too. You remember Balaam, the horse, or mule he rode, and the mule had a mind of its own because the Lord was speaking to him. I don't think the Lord was speaking to this horse I was on in New Mexico. I think this horse just had a mind. And so I started, and he starts galloping, and then we come up towards this brush area. And when I say brush, I'm not talking about, you know, like green, soft foliage. I'm talking about dead, thorny kind of stuff. And he starts, and he starts, veer, I'm pulling, go this way. And he's just continually going towards this brush. And my leg scrubs up against that. And I, I felt like I should, 
But then I thought he might have <laughs> done the high old silver thing. That horse was not rain trained with me. <laughs> oh, but see, we want to be rain trained. That's the fear of the Lord. That's when we have reverence for God. Micah 6, 8 says this. He has showed thee, O man, of what is good. What doth the Lord require of thee? See, here's that requirement again. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Notice that the statement, to do justly, justice, and then to have mercy, to love mercy. And thank God, mercy rejoices over just judgment. But he does mention justice or doing justly, this aspect of judgment, we have to have good discernment to judge between good and bad, right and wrong. But then we have to have mercy. Aren't you glad that his mercies are new? How often? And because of that, we are not consumed. <laughs> Thank God. How many of you are grateful for the mercy of God? That mercy is available to us all the time. We can actually come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in the time of need. We don't have to wait till the time of need to go to the throne of grace. We can go to that throne of grace every day, and we can get some mercy stored up, some grace stored up, and we can experience that. And then he said to walk humbly with thy God. Man, there's something beautiful, beautiful about humility in the presence of God. There's a beauty to it of being, I'm humbled before the presence of the Lord. Humility does not mean you're a doormat. That is not the humility he's talking about. There's a boldness, there's a confidence that goes with godly humility. And there's a quickness to come under what the Lord is saying because he said, listen, if you'll humble yourself under my mighty hand, I'll raise you up. And so that's why he's saying, listen, we got to walk humbly, walk justly. Uh, so question, what's required of us awaken you individual. What's required of us today? What's required of us today? Well, certainly those things. But look at uh, Mark chapter 12, 28, 29. Just a couple more, a few more, script, uh, some scriptures. Just, just a few more, and we'll be done. Mark 12, verse 28. One of the scribes came, asked him, which is the first commandment of all. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the... Oh, wait a second, wait a second, I, I forgot something. He said, the first of all the commandments, the greatest of them all is... What did he say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. See, a lot of times we skip right over to the love the Lord your God with all your might, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and that's important. But sometimes we skip over what's required of us to hear that the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, they are one. But in the Old Testament Israel, they didn't have an understanding of that. They knew God, but they didn't know him as a father. They knew him as the judge, basically. And they missed the whole thing of him being a covenant God who all these Jehovah, 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 Zidkenu, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom, they missed all of those things that he was and saw him only as a mean and angry and judging God. They didn't see him as one God, the Lord, under all of those dispensational expressions of who he was. But then we in the New Testament should have a different grasp and concept and understanding. They didn't understand who the devil was. See, a lot of times people, they're wrestling against people instead of against, you know what I'm saying? Paul wrote about it in Ephesians chapter 6. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. So if we're spending all of our time angry at or fussing against or complaining against things that are happening in the earth and with people, and we miss the whole thing, and the enemy is like really happy. He's really happy because he's got your focus completely off of him and onto people. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, might, and dominion. That's the enemy not people. Amen? I said amen? Amen. 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 And so uh, moving on to the next part of what Jesus said, and, and remembering that these are three not separate gods, 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Love the Lord our God. He is one Lord. They're not three separate gods, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're, there's one God, one Lord. They have three distinctive roles and responsibilities and never have competing agendas at any time. Do they ever have a competing agenda? Because they are one Lord. And see, we have to learn that lesson continually within our families. How many of you have family members that they have a, you know, some folk have an agenda within the family sometimes. And you got you to gotta pay attention to this and craft unity in that element, in that environment. Amen? Amen. Everybody happy? I mean, we're, we got, just got a couple of minutes here. Just a few minutes, a couple, two, three minutes. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's none other greater commandment than these. That's a pretty powerful statement. So this revelation is not the idle musing of only a good man with good ideas. When Jesus said this, it wasn't just a good man with good ideas. This is the prophetic revelation and impartation of the Holy Ghost through Jesus speaking the Father's will. What did Jesus say? I only say that which I hear my Father say. I only do what I see my Father do. So when he said this, he was bringing back to their remembrance what had been taught by Moses the prophet and had been shared with Israel, and they were supposed to live in that. Now, Randy mentioned it here, and uh, I'm looking at it in Mark, though. On the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Mark 9, verse 7, said, there was a cloud that overshadowed him. A voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. And if you can't hear me as a minister, hear him speaking through me. That's what I always do when I go places to hear people minister. Because sometimes their style of ministry may not be my style of preference or receiving. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Because it's not about that vessel per se. It's about what is God speaking through them to me. And so hear him in hearing me and all will be well. So Jesus here and this experience actually is reinforcing something that Moses shared in Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you and of your brethren. Like unto me, unto him you shall hearken or listen to. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, verse 18 says. That's Deuteronomy 18, 18, then verse 19. I'll raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto you and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, in my authority, I will require it of him. So see, there's that requirement again. He's saying, listen, I'm going to require, I'm, I'm going to require understanding of why I spoke things, meaning the Lord, and you or people or groups decided, ah, it's not the Lord. Or decided, that might be the Lord, but it's not for me. Or they just decided, that ain't the Lord. That ain't the Lord. There are some people that can just read the scripture to give a solution to people. I've done this in, in settings, I'm not talking about here, in other places where I've counseled with people. And I've shared the word with them. They came to me with a problem. I give them the word. I say, yeah, you know what? I'm not really feeling that. Mm -mm. I'm like, what? You're not feeling what? It's all right if you ain't feeling me as the communicator of this information. But it's a whole other level of stupid. <laughs> if I'm giving you the word that's presenting the solution to the problem... And you're telling me I'm not feeling that word. It's just, sometimes you say things and then you realize what you said. <laughs> but I ain't taking that back. That is a whole nother level of stupid, literally. Here's the word. I ain't feeling it. You better start feeling or you're going to be starting feeling something else. <laughs> from the Lord, not from me, from the Lord. <laughs> And this ain't me taking the word to try and slap people in the face with the word. That's not what this is about. Because there are those who will do that to manipulate people, present the word to manipulate and slap you in the face. That's not what this is about. Not at all. All right, let me close with two, two more-ish uh, passages, and then we're done. All right, so 
Uh, Zechariah 7, verses 8 through 12. The, the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Notice something about the Lord. He not only cares about the very deep spiritual things that we can glean and receive from him, but he also cares about the very practical social elements of life and the people that are, are downtrodden or depressed or, or going without for us to minister to them. That's why we have to be a part of the community that we are in to, to minister to the needs of people. Verse 11, they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder. They said, you know, I ain't feeling that one, Lord, right there. Uh, and pulled away the shoulder, stopped their ears that they should not hear. They basically started acting like little children. You ever seen, you know, a child hear something from somebody and then they're la 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 clean up your room, son. La 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 brush your teeth, daughter. Sometimes, you know, the Lord starts speaking. We don't, we don't say literally, la, 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 la. We just go find another episode on Netflix to watch. Still meddling. You were meddling last week. Brother Lance, we, that's strike two. <laughs> okay. Verse 12. Yes, they made their heart as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. Notice this, in the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit. See, we live by the word, we live by the spirit, but God will send his word in his spirit. He'll put things like this morning during worship, atmosphere of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. And then he'll put a prophetic word that carries on the waves of that movement of the spirit. See, that's when he's trying to get a point across so that you'll receive that. Because there's life-changing truth that takes place when we're in worship. You know, we prophesied and talked about this last year, breakthroughs in the, in the worship, transformation and breakthroughs in the worship. If we come in, because I come in because I had heard that word and I'd shared it, but when we're in worship, that's why, you know, some people might say, well, what are you doing up there, Brother Lance? What is that stuff you're doing? Well, see, sometimes, remember Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father say, and I only do what I see my father do. And so I saw the father chipping away. And so I'm praying up might have looked silly or stupid to other people, but I don't care about looking stupid like that. You can say I look stupid. You know, people can say, you look stupid up there. What you doing up there? Just moving around. And... <laughs> hey, look out now. I ain't twerking now. There ain't nobody. Ain't none of that happening. Ain't none of that happening. <laughs> but the whole point, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but the whole point is I saw something. And in that spirit, he put his word in the spirit to convey something to people. And so I received it. And so now from this point forward, breakthroughs in the worship. And now I'm looking for, Lord, chisel away at me. Do whatever you have to. Free me up. <laughs> Y'all know I can't do that, right? Right, right. Okay. All right, let me close with with this, this thought. What are some of the words the Lord sends in his spirit to us today in this moment to hear and to heed? Matthew eight sixteen says this, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Notice that statement. He cast out the spirits with his word. There's a time, and we were talking about this the other day, uh, there's a time where People may be oppressed by demonic spirits. That is a true thing. That is a real thing. And there are times, too, where people, not believers, believers cannot be possessed by the devil. But there can be oppression and restriction. And... But there is also the casting out of devils 
Come out! So that is one word that is a declaration of deliverance to bring devils out of people or off of people. But there is a place also where just the preaching, the teaching, the ministering, the imparting of the word will drive out spirits. The same way if you took a glass that had some dirt at the bottom and you put some water in there and it's going to look cloudy and muddy for a minute. And that's why sometimes people hear the word and they're like confused. Like, I don't get that. What is that? That's all right. Just stay under the, stay under the, the, the faucet where the word's coming out. Let that washing of the water of the word, it will drive stuff out. It's the law of displacement. The volume of water going into that vessel is going to displace the dirt, displace the spirit that is bad, wrong, evil, demonic. It'll, just that word will do it. I've seen it happen. People, their countenance will change from one part of the service to the next part because, oh, they get some revelation and this thing gets off of them and they get free. And I've seen people sit under the word week after week, week after week, week after week, and you notice this progressive deliverance and freedom that takes place. Well, that's, that's that word. It's, it's casting out that spirit, those spirits, those things that are hindering. So here's the word of the Lord to us. Love, long life, unity. Now, I'm only going to get to the first one today, but love, long life, unity. Love long life in unity. Love long life for there is long life in unity. Love unity and live a life of love. Now, if you will, go ahead and put up that other slide uh, uh, of love, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8a. And this is the amplified, declarative, expanded version of it. Notice what it says here. Start with uh, the slide before that one. Should be the slide before that. It says, I endure long. There we go. There we go. I endure long and I'm patient and kind. Now, there are degrees of difference between enduring, enduring long and enduring long with patience and kindness through the duration of whatever it is you're enduring, whether it's relationships or circumstances. I endure long and I'm patient and kind while I'm enduring long. See, that's a whole nother level of living right there. Whole different level. Because there's some people that can be real, they can endure that. I'm going to put up with this nonsense. But they're not being patient in the process. And they're not expressing that kindness of the Lord in the process of walking through. But see, this is a word from the Lord for us. I endure long and I'm patient and kind. I'm never envious, nor do I ever boil over with jealousy. I'm not boastful or vainglorious. I do not display myself haughtily. I'm not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. I'm not rude or unmannerly. I do not act unbecomingly. I do not insist on my own rights, nor on my own ways. I'm not, touch I'm not self-seeking. I'm not touchy, fretful, or resentful. Ah, I'm not touchy, fretful, or resentful. Resentful means feeling or expressing bitterness or indignation at having been treated unfairly. Has anybody ever been treated unfairly in this room? I think all of us, at some point in our lives, we can feel somebody done me wrong. They did me wrong. Treated me like a dog. Anybody ever been felt like you were treated like a dog? I have. At times I'd be like, you act like I'm over here doing woof, 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 woof. Why you treat me like this? How you gonna do a brother like that? Uh, but at those moments, I can't be thinking about getting vengeance, revenge. Because <laughs> that's what bitterness or being resentful will do. It will motivate, how can I get back at them? And all they've done is they've revealed a button, a trigger in me. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> See, when I start to be resentful about something or someone, it's because in me there's a trigger that the enemy knows about, but now maybe this person is figure it out, and they just keep presenting this, I will become resentful towards them and towards life and towards God 
so that a root of bitterness gets in me and that root of bitterness grows up and starts to defile not only me with my toxic self, but other people with that toxicity. That's what will happen by becoming resentful about what's happening in our lives. And so why it's so, so important that we say, I am not touchy, fretful, or resentful. I present it to some people, you might be a little touchy about that. I'm not touchy about that. I don't know why you're talking about I'm touchy about that. I mean, you got touchy about me talking about you being touchy. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. So we can't be any of those things. I take no account of the evil done to me, and I pay no attention to a suffered wrong. This is one of the most difficult things in life to do. But my grandmama had some conventional wisdom. She would say, to different ones who are starting to kind of rankle her nerves. She said, I ain't stutting you. You ever heard that statement? I ain't stutting you. Now, I didn't know what that meant for a while, but I did know you're not paying attention to them. You know, you can kind of stretch it out to say, I am not studying your behavior and allowing your behavior to change me. So I ain't stutting you. And that's what you have to do when people do you wrong. You don't pay attention to a suffered wrong. It's not that you're naive and you're not aware of it. You're simply saying, I'm not paying attention to this. Because we can't grow. We can't progress. We can't move forward if, if what we're spending time on is what people have done wrong to us. I ain't stutting you. Uh, I do not rejoice at injustice or unrighteousness. I rejoice when right and truth prevails. I bear up under anything and everything that comes. I'm ever ready to. And I do believe the best of every person. Talked about that in some detail last week. But this is a readiness that's forged in the heart and prepared ahead of time to believe the best of other people. Uh, my hopes and expectations in Christ are faithless under all circumstances. I endure everything without weakening. I never fail. I never fade out. I never become obsolete. And I never come to an end. Now, if you want that, you can take pictures of it, and that's awesome. Go ahead and do that. That's fine. Uh, but if you also would like to have just kind of that capsulized thing, Go to or send an email to info at awaken.tv, info at awaken.tv, and I'll send you the copy of that right there. We also have some, some uh, hard copies out there, but if you'd like to have that, definitely, because if you will take that, and we're done on this scripture, if you will take that passage, those declarations, affirmations, confessions, and you'll speak that out every day, preferably in the morning. It'll take you all of a minute to a minute and a half if you just declare it and decree it. Don't take long, but just say it. Just start, I endure long and I'm patient and kind. And you might start off saying it like this, blase, blase. I endure long and I'm patient and kind. I'm never envious. I'm never, never boil over with jealousy. I'm not boastful, vainglorious, and do not explain myself highly. I'm not conceited, arrogant, or plagued with fact. And you might get into the mumbling stage of it, not really like engage with it, but if you'll say it again. Because when you say, when you decree, when you declare, when you confess with emotion, even if it's put on emotion to begin with, I endure long, I am patient, and I am kind. I am never envious, nor do I ever boil over with jealousy. I am not boastful, vainglorious. I am not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. I am not rude or... You start attaching your emotion to it, you start, you'll start feeling it. You won't be talking a little, I ain't feeling that. No, you'll, you'll feel this. You'll feel this. More than that, it will start to direct your interactions with people. Next thing you know, all of that stuff that you thought was holding you back, your perspective will be expanded to say, no, it's not. People are not holding me back. Opinions or perspectives are not holding me back. Organizations are not holding me back. Races are not holding me back. Because, you know, there's a lot of black folks say, it's my problem is the white man. No, shut all that nonsense up. That is not, that's stupid. It's not right. It's not smart. And the same thing, you know, there are some white people who say, well, it's the black folks are holding us back now. There's some people are saying, well, it's all these illegal immigrants. That's just tearing our country up. Well, I understand about the border issues, but who are we in Christ? And then if we deal with situations like that, what should we go to as our go-to? This word of the Lord, that he has put his word in this spirit, and this will convey and carry us forward. Amen? Let's all stand up.
Thank you so much. Y'all listen so good. You gave me several extra minutes. Basically, I took them, but, <laughs> but you let me, and I appreciate it very much. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone in the room at all that you say, you know what, this word spoke to me, and there's some things, adjustments I need to make. We're not going to ask you to come forward this morning, um, but I will offer this for anyone who would like. As others are leaving, if you want to come forward, I have some oil up here, and this oil is for breaking some things off of people. And all we're going to do is you're going to set your hands out in front of me, and I'm going to put this anointing oil on your hands, and then you're going to rub them together before the Lord and let it get smeared in. And it's going to remind you to meditate the word, meditate the truth. It's going to remind you that the anointing breaks the yoke and lifts every oppression, bondage, and thing that will come against you. But with your heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone in the room that you say, you know what, I, this spoke to me, this spoke to my heart. I want to go on record with heaven saying, yes, Lord, there are some adjustments, some changes I need to make in order to live by this word. There's some things I need to adjust in my heart, adjust in my life, adjust in the way that I talk, adjust in the way that I think. If it, if that resonates with you. I'm just going to count to three. I want you to lift your hand. And this is going to be between you and the Lord and before the Lord. So if, that's, if you're saying this resonates with me, I need to make this adjustment and change in some area. One, two, three. Okay, I see several hands on both sides. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the, la the last thing I want to ask you is this. If you don't know the Lord, if, you, if you're not sure you have a relationship with the Lord, are you not, not certain you're born again, that you, you have eternal life, or if you've been away from the Lord, you know, hey, I got to get back to him. I have to get back to him now and today. And you're not going to put this off. You're not going to let the enemy speak to you differently or let your, yourself become distracted by anything else. But you're saying, I need to accept the Lord. I need to be born again, or I need to come back to him. Either one of those two things. I'm going to do the same thing count to three, and the same way others lifted their hands on that first, I'm going to just ask you to slip your hand up in the air and put it back down. If you say, I don't know that I'm saved, I'm not sure, I want to know that I'm sure, or I've been away from the Lord, and I know this morning, he's drawing me back, he's calling me back, I've got to come back to him. One, when I get to three, lift your hand, put it back down. One, two, three. Anyone at all? Okay, I see a hand. Anyone else? All right. Okay, praise God. I want you to look up at me. So everyone who raised their hand, I'm, again, I'm not asking anyone to come forward right now. If you want to have the oil on your hands, and we're not going to take a long time. It's just going to be boom, boom, boom. Praise the Lord. God can do a quick work. Amen. And cut it short in righteousness and for the clock's sake. And if you also raised your hand for the other, you say, I need to be born again. or I need to come back to the Lord closer to him. We're going to pray a prayer together here in just a moment. I want all of us to pray that prayer, but the first thing is if you raise your hand, you say, I need to make adjustments. And anybody can get involved in this right now. So let's lift a hand or both hands to heaven. I want you to say this after me. Father God, I recognize from the word that I need to live by the word and there are areas in my life I need to make adjustments about. I go on record in heaven and earth that I'm making this adjustment in this moment and from this day forward. I'm asking for help from the Holy Spirit so that I can walk in and live by the word as I make these adjustments. And I live by the word. I live by the spirit. I live by the word that's in that spirit. And I thank you that I am now saved delivered from these problems, these areas of adjustment that I'm making in Jesus name. Now I want you to, if you raise your hand for coming to the Lord or coming back to the Lord, but also let's all say this together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm asking you, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent. I turn from them. I thank you now that your word and your spirit have cleansed me. I ask for you, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me now. I confess Jesus is Lord. 
and I confess Jesus is the Son of God. And I thank you now, Lord, that I have eternal life. And those areas of my life where I need to draw closer to you, come back to you, I acknowledge today I'm coming back. I'm coming home in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. So be it. Amen. You know, the Lord has been moving all day and all morning. I don't want to prolong it, so we're not going to try to continue to stay in something when we need to move on to the next thing. And that next thing is this. If you want to do that while everybody, when I dismiss everyone, if you want to just have this oil in your hands to put together, symbolizing the anointing has come upon you for the limitations to be destroyed, obliterated, removed. It's going to take oil in one hand, oil in the other hand. You're going to put them together and you're going to say, Lord, I'm free. These limitations are broken off and I move forward in victory. Amen. So I release the blessing of the Lord upon you, everyone, individually, all of us together, corporately, as we leave this place, as we go forward throughout our week. Thank you for the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, adds no sorrow, being upon every individual. Thank you, Father, for the grace, the empowering, equipping ability of God being upon every one of us, flooding our lives, going before us. Thank you for angelic protection. I release angels on behalf of every individual in this room to protect, keep, sustain, preserve, promote, and minister to every one of us and all of our families. I draw a bloodline around us. I plead the blood of Jesus over us and I speak life over you because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and quickens your mortal body and gives you life and that life is more than enough. You have victory. I decree victory over you. And I decree that the prosperity of God will be manifested to you before the end of this month. The prosperity of God manifested to you before the end of this month in Jesus' name. Everybody who agrees, who receives this, say amen. amen. So be it. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for those who have been watching. We ask uh, that those who would like to have the oil come on forward. Everyone else, feel free to be dismissed. We love you. God bless you. See you next time.